All right, looks like we've still got people filing in, but I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, when I talk about alternatives to, to invasive species, what I'm trying to look for are species that maybe have some of the same characteristics as the invasive, maybe it has good fall color, uh, season of flower, flower type, leaf shape, uh, maybe it's the size of plant, maybe it's a plant that provides a screen or um, is an evergreen, large shade tree, that kind of thing. So a lot of the, the suggestions I have um, are trying to fit some characteristic of the invasive that um, I'm assuming is the reason why people still have them. Okay, so the first species I'm gonna um, talk about is Chinese tallow. Um, hopefully everyone knows Chinese tallow. It's very common on the coast. It's one of the only things that gives us fall color. It's also called popcorn tree. And that's partly because of the um, clusters of white uh, waxy berries that you see in the winter. Um, you can sometimes even buy uh, Christmas wreaths that are made out of these berries, unfortunately. I've seen them at Target. Um, so some of the alternatives I'm going to talk about are things that have good fall color. Tallow is also promoted uh, by beekeepers. They really love that tree. So um, a lot of the names I'm talking about are also good for bees. So uh, kind of a no-brainer for the coast is red maple. Um, it's a medium-sized deciduous tree here. Um, we find it mostly on the coast in wetlands or wetland edges. Um, good fall color. Um, interesting flowers. Here it's already bloomed in coastal Georgia, so we're starting to see the Samaras form that are kind of a nice red color as well. Black Tupelo. Um, you might also hear this one called um, black gum. Uh, this is a, a, a somewhat common tree on coastal Georgia. There's a couple different species, some that grow in wetlands, some on the edge. This is more of an edge wetland to upland species. Great fall color. It can be variable, um, kind of a mottled red to a, to a full red, but it's um, also you might see sold tupelo honey. So this is a great tree if you're a beekeeper um, and you still want um, to be providing pollen for your, your beehive. Um, Florida sugar maple. So we can't really grow the standard sugar maple here on the coast because it just gets too hot. Um, so Florida sugar maple, it is found in some isolated pockets in coastal Georgia. Um, it's a smaller tree than the normal sugar maple, um, maybe up to 20, 25 feet. So that's good for a smaller landscape. Deciduous, it has more of a yellow fall color with some orange kind of hinting in it. Um, so it's a great option. Really widespread native on the coast and a lot of dry uplands, old fields um, is persimmon. Um, Really variable fall color. This top left corner is a picture that I took. Bright kind of, I don't know, maybe uh, bronzy red. I'm colorblind, so don't take my colors <laughs> um, descriptions to heart. Um, but a really common tree. I mean, it's great for retracting wildlife because of the fruit. Um, I've never actually eaten the fruit in the wild because it's always taken by the wildlife. Um, if you've tasted the fruit, you've probably had a really bad reaction because it can be very astringent when it's not ripe. So it can be very bitter and kind of suck the moisture out of your mouth. That's the only experience I've had with it since um, it is so attractive to wildlife that they tend to, to get the fruit before we do. <clears throat> All right, the next non-native tree, which some people are surprised it's non-native because it's been around so long, is mimosa. So it has this um, very showy flower um, compound leaf. So I'm gonna talk about some things that um, have showy flowers in the spring. So one I'm probably gonna talk about multiple times today is the red buckeye. It's a, a great small tree native to various habitats in coastal Georgia on the barrier islands. Um, you can sometimes also see it where you have a lot of shell in the soil, but it's quite adaptable, very suitable for the home landscape. It has these really attractive tubular flowers that attract hummingbirds. So that's a great benefit and it won't get too big. Another great small tree um, is fringe tree or uh, Crancy Graybeard's another name for it. It has really unusual um, clusters of tassel-like flowers in the spring. It's deciduous and it has somewhat decent fall color. Um, one you're probably all familiar with is very common, um, very early spring flower. One of the first uh, trees to bloom here is uh, Eastern Redbud. Um, has a lot of adapt adaptability. 
um, in coastal mm -hmm. Georgia. Um, I just wouldn't put it somewhere where you, you have a lot of salt spray or anything like that. Um, it wouldn't be able to handle that kind of thing. Um, a tree that I think people should be planting a lot more of is the two-wing silverbell. Um, naturally, we find this on the Altamaha River on maybe moist slopes, um, but it is found in the horticulture trade and they do have some cultivars. Um, really nice um, spring display of flowers. And I think it's a great alternative also to dogwoods and dogwoods really don't do so well on the coast. They just always kind of look sad. Um, so I think this is a good alternative to that as well. So calorie pear, um, this is a species that really has only presented itself as being invasive in the last 10 years or so. It was kind of a, a popular, kind of a cheap tree. Um, I've never really liked it even before it became invasive. Um, it has a funny smell. Some people say it smells like urine or fish. Um, it has really bad structure and it would break apart, but um, over time, the genetics has gotten more complicated and it's become fertile where before it was sterile. And so now it's producing fruit and the progeny of that um, has big thorns and you can see it invading field edges, uh, old fields, and it's kind of a nasty plant now to even have around. So um, never really encourages as a, a, a tree in the first place, but some great native alternatives. Um, I think people should start looking at some of our native hawthorns um, might not be knocking your socks off with the flower display, but um, mayhaw, which is one of the most available in the trade that you might know of from mayhaw jelly, um, is a great small native tree. Black tie tie, this one's a little more obscure. I don't see a lot of people using it. This one's native to sort of saturated soils in coastal Georgia. Um, it has a really nice display of um, flowers, very attractive to bees and other pollinators. It's evergreen. Um, I think you can work with it to kind of give it some good shape. Um, I think there might be some cultivars that they have now done that have pink flowers. Uh, Snowbell, another one that we find in um, a lot of different habitats in coastal Georgia. I've seen it in dry places. I've seen it on wet slopes. Um, it's more of a shrub. Um, or a multi-trunk small tree. Um, you can see the flowers. Um, it's kind of similar to the um, two-wing silver bell, but another great um, white spring flowering plant. Again, the two-wing silver bell, I'll probably talk about this one multiple times. I think, again, more people should be planting it. Um, China berry, this is um, a really common invasive on field edges. Um, Let's see, someone put that. So that is a point, important topic. Tai Tai can get out of control. Um, in areas we definitely have um, spots where we don't have fire coming into the system very much, um, and Tai Tai can definitely um, take over. And there was a question about um, sun or shade. So I will try to talk more about sun and shade as well. Okay, devil's walking stick. This is um, a part shade to full sun um, native, maybe not most useful in um, all landscapes, but the tree I'm talking about here is China berry as an alternative. It has big compound leaves, um, has berries that persist in the winter. Uh, I'll go back to that slide um, and spring flowers. So um, devil's walking stick has these really big compound leaves, huge flower clusters that are very showy and pollinator and bird magnets. Um, and then the, the fruit, again, are, are bird magnets um, after they're produced. But if you see the stem there, maybe not something you wanna put by your front door, but I think it's something, if you have a larger landscape, it, it would um, be a good wildlife benefit. Another one that maybe you don't want by your front door, but this one's common on um, causeways next to our salt marshes or hammocks or in the dunes. So this can take full sun, very sandy soils. Um, you see it on the edges of maritime forests. So just dry uplands, full sun to part shade. Um, I think it makes a very unique um, sort of specimen tree, um, deciduous, under 30 feet tall. A similar kind of habitat, full sun to part shade, um, wing sumac, again, roads, uh, causeway edges, marsh hammocks, um, very coastal species. Um, 
spring flowers are attractive to bees and butterfly or pollinators and um, orange or sorry reddish kind of orange uh, seed clusters in the in the fall um, which you can actually use to make sort of um, a citrusy tasting um, a drink if you kind of soak them it's also you can use the the berries um, for uh, different spice mixes so sumac is a popular um, spice in the Middle Eastern region. There's a, the Zatar mix, which uses um, sumac as part of that. Soapberry is um, a tree that we do have in coastal Georgia, but it's more tied towards um, places that have calcium in the soil, maybe an old shell midden. Um, there's a lot of it in, in North Georgia, or sorry, North Florida at the Timaquan Preserve, if you've ever been there, but it has a compound leaf um, it has berries very similar to China berry, um, and the berries can actually be used um, for making a lather. That's why it's called soap berry. The berries have saponin in them, um, and so um, that's kind of an interesting use for this plant. Okay, camphor tree. If you're in coastal Georgia, you see this one everywhere. It's a really tall, dense evergreen tree. Um, it just comes up everywhere. Um, it's got um, berries and kind of um, camphory, fragrant, sort of medicinal smelling leaves if you crush them. So some native alternatives, I'm thinking of large evergreen trees um, that do produce berries that are very tough, can grow in a lot of different types of habitats. So southern magnolia, kind of an obvious one, um, very dense evergreen tree, shade tree. It has um, kind of a cone with red berries, very attractive flowers in the summer. Um, there are different cultivars, depending on if you're okay using cultivars, that can make this, um, depending on the size and space you have in your landscape, something you could use. Um, Overcup oak, this is a, a native um, tree that we find on the Altamaha. So it, it's native to more saturated soils, but it is adaptable, full sun to part shade, large tree has a great shape. Um, the acorns are attractive to, to waterfowl and other wildlife. Devilwood osmanthus, you find this in a variety of forested habitats. So naturally it's kind of in part shade, but you can also grow this in, in full sun. It makes a nice um, evergreen small tree. You could also hedge it. Um, it's related to um, olive, it's an olive family. Um, you might know the other osmanthus like um, fragrant tea olive. It's related to that, but obviously this is a native. Our American holly, um, there's cultivars of this as well. Um, great dense evergreen, um, has attractive berries in the uh, winter. Um, if it's old enough, they do get quite large, um, can make a great screen. And it's a good place for um, birds to take cover because it's kind of surrounded by thorns. So that's an important thing to, to give um, wildlife in the landscape is places to take cover. So the privets. Um, so there's three different privets, the Chinese privet on the left, um, glossy privet in the middle, and I guess what people around here call ligustrum, which is just the, the genus or wax privet. The one on the right is what's most commonly used in landscaping here. The first two I mentioned are the ones that are far more invasive and definitely don't want people to use. Um, wait, it's kind of hard to tell the last two apart. The, um, the way you, you basically tell is the, um, the glossy privet, the leaves kind of cup in more. You can kind of see that in the photo and the wax privet on the one on the far right. They're more um, flat and a little bit thicker leaves. Um, we just don't see the one on the right um, popping up in the landscape. Um, without being planted very often. But I think there's, a, even, even with that said, there's great native alternatives to, to, to not even being using any of the privets. So evergreen is what we're looking for, things that you can hedge. We've talked about the devil wood osmanthus already as kind of a small evergreen tree, but I think it also has use as kind of an evergreen hedge if you kind of keep it trimmed down. Very easy one to work with is our native Yopon holly, found in a variety of habitats, full sun to, to part shade. Um, there are various cultivars of this, um, mainly weeping or standard or dwarf. Um, 
the picture on the top right is actually at Altama Plantation, which is a state property that we manage. And that's a picture of a formal garden that was put in in the 1930s that we are uh, renovating, um, trying to bring back. It was overgrown. overgrown. <clears throat> so it can take to hedging very well. Florida privet. So um, there's actually a native privet. Um, this is one you would see naturally in areas that have shells. So on the causeway of Jekyll, there's some shell middens that have Florida privet. Um, we have some coming up around the DNR office. It's more um, semi evergreen, sort of tardily deciduous. Um, it kind of turns like a, a, a yellowish color in the winter um, before it drops its leaves and put, puts on the new leaves. Um, so it's not fully evergreen. Um, here's some pictures of some folks who have um, used it as a formal hedge. Um, otherwise, it's very similar to the privets. Um, it's just a lot more tame and it's native to our area. Um, yellow anise, um, this is maybe more of a Florida native, but it's, it's very easily found in the horticulture trade. Um, very easy to grow, um, really dense, um, evergreen growth. Um, might do a little bit better in, in part shade. Maybe if it's in full sun, you give it a little bit more moisture, um, but very commonly found. So Iliagnus, um, this is a, a plant that I think is outsized for most home landscapes anyways. It sends out these really big arching branches and can amass in size quite readily. Um, I think it's only suitable if you like using a hedge trimmer every, every week or so. But it's, it's used at um, interstate exchanges on, on sort of slopes and kind of take to kind of um, claim a whole area that can't be mowed maybe. And so it's just something that they, I guess they've been planting to kind of cover those areas. Um, it has interesting sort of grayish speckled leaves and the flowers do have a nice smell in the fall. Um, so when I'm thinking of alternatives, I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's a slope that you're trying to plant on. You want something that's gonna create a big screen um, or on dry soil. So we talked about the yellow anise already, huge mounding shrub. Um, so we won't talk about that one too much more, but um, one that's native to our area that's a lot smaller. It grows about three feet, natural little mounding habit. Um, this grows in part shade to full sun in deep sands in coastal Georgia. It has a range that I think it obviously goes up to New Jersey with the name, but it has a huge range throughout the Eastern US, but it um, puts down a really deep tap root. So it's really good for areas that have deep sandy soils and with that root system, it, it's really good for stabilizing slopes. You just want to plant it where you want it because it does not transplant very well once you have it where it's supposed to go. Again, we've talked about Yopon holly. Um, and another one you could think of um, that's native here is the coastal cedar. So this is different than the Eastern red cedar. Um, it has a slightly different growth habit, um, has I think more of a tortured, kind of interesting sculptural look than the, the regular Eastern red cedar. But you find this one in full sun, um, marsh hammocks, um, dunes, that kind of thing. Um, there is some natural variation where you find some that have more of a grayish cast to the, to the foliage. Um, but it's a, it's a great one for planting on a slope if you, or if you wanna create a, a screen, um, can grow in very uh, dry soils. Um, so really tough plant. So heavenly bamboo is, is one we, we don't want people planting. It's very popular. It's an old fashioned garden plant. Um, it's invasive. It can pop up in, in a lot of places, but also the seeds have contained cyanide. So it does take a lot to, to have an effect from eating the seeds. So species like cedar waxwings that have a habit of gorging on seeds when they're available are the biggest threat. So there have been flocks of cedar waxwings um, you can Google that and kind of pull up the news articles where they've gorged on, on heavily bamboo and um, have died. So it's definitely one we don't want people planting. <clears throat> so things that have kind of a neat texture. So it has kind of a nice texture, I guess, and those red berries are attractive. So coral bean is one of our native plants that does have red berries and really attractive flowers in the spring. And then the leaf texture is kind of interesting. It's this three part leaf um, that could almost look like a Chinese tallow if you didn't look closely enough. Um, they do have some slight thorns on them 
And the seeds are actually poisonous. So humans probably don't want to eat it, but they're not a threat to wildlife. Um, and as you can see, those tubular flowers are really attractive to hummingbirds. Um, and it's a very tough plant. Uh, one of our hardy palms that we have on the coast is needle palm. Um, kind of has a, a mounding habit when you when it gets to a good age, about three to six feet. Um, this is more of a part shade as far as where it's found naturally. I tend to see it on areas that have a little bit maybe more moisture in the soil, but I think it has a nice uh, interesting um, texture when you get a, a large plant growing. Um, we've talked about wing sumac and I'm kind of bringing it up here again because it has those red berries in the fall um, and, and pretty good fall color. And then it has, I think the leaves are kind of a nice texture. So another sort of smaller shrub, maybe the same size niche as the Nandina would be um, Virginia Sweet Spire. There's several cultivars that are available. Um, you don't really have the berries, but you have kind of a nice textural, small mounding shrub, and, but you do have some good fall color um, with this one. It does tend to spread a little bit. So you probably want to plant this in an area where you're okay with the, the shrub kind of moving a little bit within where you've planted it. Um, coral ardesia, it's very similar in look, I guess, to the, the Nandina. Um, we see this popping up here and there on the coast. We actually had um, someone from Sapelo texted me the other day, asking me what, what something was, and it turned out to be a coral ardesia. <clears throat> but it has this really showy display of red berries kind of right under the, the top layer of leaves. Um, it can take over kind of moist woods and just kind of dominate that ground layer. So definitely more of a coastal Georgia, Florida kind of species. Um, so I'm bringing up things that have red berries again. So coral bean, which we've talked about. Um, another one of our native hollies that has red berries that you should look into is the Dahoon holly. Um, it gets a lot bigger than a, um, a coral ardesia, but it's a great native shrub with red berries. Um, we have several native viburnums that have good berry displays. Um, the one I'm talking about here is possum haw. Um, we tend to see this one more native to wetlands, maybe full sun to part shade. Um, it has interesting kind of blue black fruit in the summer. But again, this one's a little bit taller, about 15 feet. We also have a possum haw holly, which is maybe confusing. Um, this is one of our um, deciduous hollies. Um, these pictures I took on the right, I think I took these in December. So the, the fruit are being shown at the same time as some of the kind of yellow fall color. So this is another good native holly with red berries to think about using in the landscape. So I've kind of lumped these two non-native grasses together. Uh, Chinese silvergrass, we don't have a big problem with this on the coast. It's supposed to be too hot and humid for it, but in other parts of the state, you can see it on roadsides. Very popular native plant, or sorry, uh, very popular grass that people have planted. Um, so we don't want people planting that. And then giant reed is planted kind of here and there. It's more of an old fashioned plant, but you might be, you might see some stands of those sticking around. Um, it's a very large kind of caney type uh, grass. So I just wanted to kind of use that as a way to talk about some of our great native grasses that are probably a lot more suitable for our, our landscapes and obviously aren't going to be invasive. Um, so on the coast, we've got sand cord grass, which is one of the Spartinas. Um, it grows in sun to part shade. We see this here on the edges of uh, salt marshes, so it's adaptable to um, so, uh, salinity. We also see it in uh, sort of freshwater wetlands on barrier islands, um, but it also does well in uplands, so it's quite adaptable. It's a clump forming grass, so it's not going to it's not rhizomatous, it's not going to spread that way. It's quite tall, about three to four feet, and you don't really have um, a showy flower display in this one. It's just kind of a nice wispy clumping grass, and you can usually find it um, pretty well in the horticulture trade. One you might be a little bit more familiar with is muley grass. The one I'm showing here is the one we see on our barrier islands, which is sweet grass, which is what they make the sweet grass baskets out of. Um, what you might see more in the horticulture trade is um, pink muley. This has got more of a purple flower, but pink muley is what you usually see in the horticulture trade, which is Muhlenbergia capillaris. Um, but either one is a great alternative to any of these exotic invasive um, 
uh, grasses. And obviously you get those very showy kind of airy flowers in the fall. Sort of similar to that is the purple love grass. Um, this is a full sun, probably do, do better in full sun, you probably get better show. Um, it's more of like a little um, puff ball that's right on the ground. So it's only about two feet tall. Um, doesn't have really a lot of character when it's growing in the growing season. It's really when those purple flowers kind of appear in the fall that um, you really get a good impact. So this is more of a front of the garden edge kind of plant. I wouldn't put it too far back. You would just kind of get buried. So purple top, this is a grass that we find on the edges of the maritime forest. So it's kind of a part shade, full sun plant. Um, the foliage is kind of nice. It's kind of a nice clean green clumping grass. It's not a spreader. Um, and then in the fall, it, it sends up these um, flower stalks that sit quite a bit higher up from the, the clump of uh, foliage at the bottom. And so it kind of has this nice um, airy quality to it. And so it's something that's maybe better to plant a little bit farther back in the garden. Um, so uh, you have other things that are coming up in front of it. And then in the fall, this kind of gives you some height farther back in the garden. So obviously we don't want people planting bamboos at all. So um, golden bamboo is the worst. It's one of those runner bamboos. Um, but if you like that look, that kind of um, sectioned off um, grass cane, and you want something that looks like that, maybe you could plant on a fence edge. We have a couple natives. They might not be usable in everyone's landscape, but switch cane um, or river cane, um, we find this a lot of habitats throughout coastal Georgia. There's a lot on Jekyll. Um, the way you can tell it from the bamboo is in this picture, you can see the sheaths on it, little sort of papery uh, tan colored uh, little appendages there persist on the native. On things like golden bamboo, you wouldn't have that little sheath, but very similar look to the non-native bamboos. Um, it will move, so you need to know that. Um, maybe this is just something you now would recognize in your yard. Maybe you already have it. Um, you can maybe mow to keep it in a place where you want it. Um, it can grow quite tall. Another one that we find in freshwater wetlands and ditches in the fall is um, sugarcane plume grass. Um, a really showy uh, kind of reddish purple flower panicle in the fall. It's a clump grass, so it's not really going to spread. Um, but again, this one's more of a wetland kind of plant, so you kind of need that kind of um, habit, habitat for it to persist. <clears throat> so big leaf lantana, very popular, especially for those who want to be providing flowers for pollinators. Um, there's different lantanas, so the one I'm focused here is that one that has the multicolored flowers and creates a huge shrub. Um, the other lantana is at least in coastal Georgia that are single colored. Um, I think those are Lantana monividensis are less bad. We still would rather you plant a native plant instead, but this one in particular, um, you can, it can show up in our dunes. Um, you see it a lot in sort of old parts of town, at least down here, um, kind of waste areas, abandoned lots, um, that kind of thing. So some of our great natives, this, this one here is more of a Florida native, but it's very popular to be used here, full sun, um, very tolerant of salt spray. Um, this one spreads out though, so it, one plant can be about six feet. It's kind of a, um, a, a very low spreading plant. It's somewhat of a perennial, but it's more of an annual. You might get a couple years out of it, but does reseed. Um, if you do have problems with deer, they're gonna annihilate this plant. So if you've got a lot of deer, they're not, this plant is not deer resistant. So it might not be for you, okay. Um, one of the cone flowers, a soft hair cone flower. Um, this one's full sun to part shade. Uplands, about two feet tall. Um, this one's supposed to have some deer tolerance because there's some hairs on it, but a lot of things I think they're labeled deer tolerant. When they're young and sort of luscious growing, there's, they can still be kind of um, eaten by the deer. It's only when they sort of harden off that you get some of that full deer resistance. But this one flowers kind of summer through fall. Um, another great native, um, spotted bee balm. Um, this is the only bee balm we have native to coastal Georgia. Um, some of the others that are more popular in the horticulture trade, we really don't find here. Um, so this one has maybe a little bit of a different type of flower than you might be um, used to with the name bee balm. Um, it has more of kind of like an airbrushed 
bracts or, or um, sort of showy leaves right before the flowers. And each of the flowers have little specks on it, but they're little um, like tubular flowers uh, kind of common to, to the mints. Um, so this one grows naturally sort of full sun to part shade, very dry. Um, it can seed out a little bit, so you might have to edit it out of places when you're growing it. And I tend to cut mine back a little bit as the season goes. Um, it's kind of stopping um, in early summer to kind of get it to branch and have more of a compact structure. And we've already talked about um, New, Jer New Jersey tea. We talked about how it has uh, really deep taproot, full sun to part shade um, in deep soils. Um, it's, it's a great um, attractant for pollinators. So if you have an aquatic situation and, um, or a pond, one of the species that's been popular for quite a while is water hyacinth, but um, we really don't want people planting it. It's a floating aquatic. Um, it can double its population in two weeks and really cover open water, making it a closed off system, changing the dissolved oxygen. Um, obviously making not much light in there, changing the nutrient cycle. So we've got some, if you've got a wetland pond, there's some great natives in coastal Georgia that um, aren't gonna take over that are, these are all rooted and they're more edge plants. So the first one is golden club, really interesting, um, obviously golden spikes in the spring. It's also called never wet. If you pour water on the leaves, it just kind of rolls off. So that's kind of fun. A really common plant we find in ditches here is pickerel weed. It's closer related to water hyacinth, so you get that really similar look. Um, really attractive. You see it covered in pollinators when it's in full bloom um, in the summer. It does create colonies, so this one will kind of uh, spread a little bit more than maybe the others. Um, one of our Sagittarius arrowhead. Um, this one is freshwater to brackish. I see it less often than pickerel weed. Um, it's another one that will form a colony. Um, it has these interesting white flowers in the summer and these arrow-shaped leaves. Um, Southern blue flag iris. Um, this one's like maybe a late spring flower. Um, you, I mostly see this one in part shade, but it could probably also do full sun. Obviously wetland um, ponds, wet, wetland edges. Um, I don't think it has to be in standing water, but um, saturated soils. I think I took these pictures at Oki Finoki. <clears throat> so asparagus fern is our next one. It's a popular plant for people because it's very tough, can grow in really um, dry, sandy soils. Um, I just think we could do better. <laughs> and it, we do see this one popping up on our barrier islands in the dunes. Um, it's not the most invasive thing we deal with, but um, I definitely think we can do better. So if you're looking for a tough plant, deep sandy soils, full sun, we could start with prickly pear. Um, you might not want to put it where you have small children who might run through, but we find this growing naturally in our dunes and inland on sand hills. It's a very tough plant, drought tolerant. Obviously, the you know what the, the plant itself looks like, really showy flowers, um, and then these orange um, fruit that you can use for different things. Um, another really kind of striking um, native plant that we find in our dunes and in sand hills is um, Adam's needle, or you might know it as yucca. There's two different kinds. This is not the Spanish bayonet one where it'll kind of poke your eye out. This one, it's uh, more flexible. And then on the leaves, you have these little filaments, which is part of the, the scientific name, yucca filamentosa. So its leaves are more flexible with little filaments, um, but you have this really very um, attractive uh, flower display in the summer. So Georgia basil, um, this one really isn't a coastal native. Um, I think it's more um, southwest Georgia. You might find some natural populations, but it's very common in the horticulture trade and does quite well in dry soils and full sun. And it has the flowers in kind of the cool season. Like if you've ever grown a rosemary, you have that same kind of thing where right now you're getting flowers in your rosemary. So it's kind of the similar type of plant. Um, and there's a, another plant called false rosemary, which is similar, but has more of a grayish look to it than Georgia basil. Um, I like to plant those together or uh, masses next to each other to kind of give some uh, play on the texture and the color between those two. Um, Kunti, some people call this one Florida Kunti. 
but I don't because there are historic re records for Georgia. Um, there are none found in the wild so far in Georgia, but it was very popular. And that's partly why we might not be seeing it anymore. It was collected a lot um, for uh, planting in the horticulture trade, um, but it's a very tough plant. It um, can grow in deep soils or, or sorry, dry soils, um, kind of a, a lower version of maybe a cycad palm, a, a sago palm. Um, so if you kind of like that look, but it's, you don't want anything that's going to get too big, um, this is a great, great plant to use. So the next plant I'm going to talk about is uh, Mexican milkweed. So this is another popular plant for folks um, who are wanting to provide um, pollinator materials all, as well as host plant material for uh, monarchs. So this plant can be invasive. I've not seen it do so in coastal Georgia, but part of the story is more the fact that it, it doesn't um, uh, stop flowering when our natives do. And so there's a relationship with um, monarchs not migrating because this plant is continuing to provide nectar material. So our natives would stop flowering in August or so and, and die back, prompting monarchs to go ahead and migrate. But this plant's presence in the um, environment causes them to not and they will get a protozoan disease called OE. Um, so there's a negative relationship beyond it being invasive of sort of messing up monarch migration. So we'd rather people plant natives that are in sync with um, these sort of natural cycles. And so I'm just gonna go over a couple of the native um, milkweed species that are just better to use in our landscape. So the first one is butterfly milkweed. Um, one of the unfortunate things about some of our natives is they, they're not gonna, be pound for pound the same as the Mexican milkweed as far as ease of growth and size. Um, so the first one, the butterfly milkweed is a lot smaller, might take a lot longer in your garden to get to good size, um, but it's a tough plant once you get it started. Nice orange flowers. The one way you can really tell this from the non-native is um, the Mexican milkweed has these multicolored flowers, whereas our native butterfly milkweed, it's a single shade of orange, it's not bicolored. Um, swamp milkweed is another great one if you've got moist soils, um, really attractive, pink, deep pink flowers. Um, another one if you've got really uh, deep sandy soils um, is sand, sand hills milkweed. This is the one that I see monarch caterpillars on on the coast all the time. I don't see them on the others. Um, so if you've got a sand hill um, and you can get this established, that would be great. It's not easy to transplant. It grows or germinates from seed quite easily, but it's not very easy to transplant. So if you do get some seed of this, you probably want to direct sow it into the location and um, kind of protect it or watch it, but um, it, it's a little bit harder to kind of propagate in a pot and plant. Another um, great native milkweed is clasping milkweed. Um, so this is another one that's supposed to be providing host material for monarchs, um, mainly because it has a lot of leaf material. The leaf material is available in the spring. Um, but it, this is a quite bigger one. It's, it grows more in um, dry uplands, um, full sun to part shade. Um, so it's another great one to try if you can get your hands on it. Japanese honeysuckle. So um, not many people are still planting it, but it's obviously poking around here. Um, you might have it on an abandoned lot or um, it just came with the house and you bought it or birds planted it. Um, but if you want an alternative to that, the showy vine with um, pretty flowers, we've got a native alternative to, to uh, Japanese honeysuckle, which is the native honeysuckle, which I think is a lot more attractive. I think the color of the foliage is more pleasing. The flowers are really pretty attractive to, hummingbird, to hummingbirds. Um, and it's semi evergreen. I've got one planted at my house and it lo lost its leaves this year, but maybe in a, a more mild winter, you'd have the leaves maintained. <clears throat> So Carolina jessamine is the next one. This will be one of the first um, things to flower in this spring. It's probably already flowering now. Um, evergreen vine, very popular, um, native to a wide range of habitats, full sun, part shade, um, dry soils, really tough plant. Um, butterfly pea, this one flowers a little bit later in the summer. Um, obviously one of our native legumes. Um, really kind of interesting flower shape, and then you can sort of see the, the bean pod on this one on the left. Um, 
And then climbing aster is one that's native to the coast. We tend to see it on wetland edges, so on moist soils, full sun to part shade, but it's adaptable to drier soils. You might need to get a little bit of water, um, but even um, combining these, since they all have different flowering times, might be a good idea where you get the early spring, the summer, late summer and fall, all in one trellis or fence line, if you kind of mix these together. <clears throat> So the wisterias, um, some people think these are native since they're so widespread, um, but you can see that one climbing the trees. Um, there's two different, there's a Japanese and Chinese wisteria, very popular for gardens. Um, but we have a native wisteria, um, American wisteria, which I think is equally, if not more attractive. It's still a vine, but it's less aggressive than the non-native. Um, another great native vine on the coast is Virgin's Bower. It's one of our clematis species. Um, I also bring this one up because we do have sweet autumn clematis, which is a non-native invasive that looks similar, but if you look at the leaves of this one, it has teeth, little, um, uh, little teeth or lobes on it. The, um, the sweet autumn clematis, is, the leaves are very smooth. All the lobes don't have those little teeth. So you might want to watch out for that in summer if you've got a white flowering Clematis to kind of check out which one it is. And if it's the non-native one, you want to get rid of it. Um, passion vine, if you're looking for something very aggressive, <laughs> this is it. Um, so caveat on some of the natives, they, some can be aggressive. So just you need to know that going into it. Um, this is one maybe you want to plant in a pot or surrounded by concrete, um, or if you have kind of a back area where you can allow it to be more natural. Uh, this, is, this one is a great host plant for butterflies and pollinators. Um, the fruit birds are supposed to eat the fleshy fruit as well, um, but um, full sun, part shade, um, dry soils, we see it growing in a lot of sort of disturbed places, so it's widely adaptable. Um, hemp vine, this one's maybe a little obscure, but it's a native vine we have on the coast. We, I see it growing up um, shrubs that are at edges of wetlands, um, so if you have that kind of situation, um, it's easy to get seeds from this one. Um, and it's very attractive to pollinators. It's a late summer flowering. Um, it kind of has a hemp type of look to it. Um, English ivy, I know you all probably know this one, um, can climb up trees, smother ground cover, um, evergreen vine. So some native alternatives to that kind of um, look. Partridge pea, so we find this one in moist sites, it's evergreen. Um, pretty heavy shade in most places. Um, I personally haven't had any luck establishing this as a ground cover because most of the spaces I have are pretty dry. Um, but if you've got kind of a moist area, it might be worth trying partridge pea. The next one that um, is very tough is a powder puff. So tough you might want to plant in an area where you're okay with it kind of um, taking over. So we've got this planted at the DNR office in full sun to part shade. Um, and it does a really good job of, of creating a ground cover there. Um, it, it's kind of interactive. You can touch the leaves and they'll close up. So that's kind of fun. And then it has these sort of Dr. Seuss-like uh, flower, uh, flower puffs. Um, Sars vine. So this is one of our Smilaxes. And you might be like, I don't want to plant a cat briar. Um, this one's supposed to be more thornless. Um, it grows more as a ground cover um, in sort of dry, partly shady sites. And it has a really neat um, uh, kind of glossy red berry clusters that you can use in holiday displays. Um, it has kind of a mottled leaf. Um, I, I haven't used this a lot myself in a landscape setting, but I think it's worth trying. Um, I think it's a really cool plant. So we've already talked about Carolina jessamine, but as far as a ground cover, I think you could try it as that. I know it's going to want to try to climb, but um, it's a pretty tough plant. Um, and I think it could have potential as, as using as a ground cover. Okay, I know I've kind of rushed through that a lot. Um, so I'm gonna pull up the chat and see if um, there's any more. So another note, um, and I think it's related to the, um, the Mexican milkweed. So if you do have it, um, one of the recommendations is, and if you don't wanna get rid of it, is to cut it down in late summer. So try to force that plant to, to um, kind of mimic the natural patterns of our plants. Is, uh, if it's not gonna go dormant, you might wanna force it to go dormant. So um, 
so that um, you can keep those monarchs from not migrating. Okay, are there any, sorry, are there any resources you recommend for identifying, identifying invasive plants? <clears throat> so there are a couple apps. So um, if you go to the um, www.edmaps, I'll type it into the chat. Uh, there's an app called um, CDEN or just the EdMaps app, and it's for um, reporting invasive species. But you can, it also has information on how to identify them. Um, there's a Forest Service um, booklet that was a two part booklet on managing and identifying invasive species um, by Miller. Um, it's also in app form. Um, sorry, I think I sent that directly to Emma, not to the group. Um, that you can download, just Google or put in your app store Southern Forest. Um, and you should be able to pick up that app. And it has a lot of great information on how to identify it. And it shows photos of things throughout the season. So um, just in your app store, type in um, Southern Forest and it should pop up. Um, it's a Forest Service app. <coughs> All right, let's see. Is there a way to view the slide deck after the presentation? So this is going to be um, recorded and I'll put it on our YouTube channel. Do you have recommended, do you recommend airwood viburnums as shrubs here on, in coastal area? Um, I think it would do fine. Um, I don't have um, experience growing it here, but I think um, I wouldn't put it in a really deep sandy area. Uh, okay, I think that's all the questions. Um, so hopefully you all found this somewhat useful or at least kind of tempts you to start using some uh, native plants instead of some of these invasives. Um, all right, well, no more questions. I appreciate y'all's time and uh, hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. All right, see y'all.